in the house and if you're watching over Facebook or the live stream we're going to do communion at the conclusion of the lesson today and so if you're here if you, don't, if you didn't get a communion set if you hold your hand up we want to make sure everybody's got one everybody served everybody how about an outline of the study of communion everybody got that oh man they did good tonight um i heard something kind of alarming pastor mel was talking about faithfulness and the quality of faithfulness uh from what i understand I heard, I, I think it's Pastor Greg Locke was talking about it, so if this is incorrect, we can uh, lay it at his door. But from what I, he had said, in America today, only 40% of churches that were operating before COVID are fully operating today. 40% of churches in America and of that 40%, an average, they averaged 25% of the attendance they had before COVID. So there's definitely a struggle going on in the spirit world. And um, so I just, we just really need to pray, you know, God will touch and his people will be able to get back to worshiping him and, and not allow, not to mention the other things that are coming against the church. I woke up this morning early from a very prophetic dream. I wrote it down. I was sharing it with my wife. I may share it Sunday. But uh, basically the punchline or the finishing of it, God said everything that happens to this country, well, he, he said everything that happens to this country will not come near the glory road. And I'm thinking the glory road. I remember an old, uh, an old song, the glory road. But he said it, it won't come near, or it won't. It'll he'll stop it. He said I will stop it before it reaches my children. And I just thank God for that. And I, like I said, I'll, I'll share it with you Sunday when I've had a chance to process it a little more. Uh, it was a good dream. It wasn't a bad dream, but anyway. Um, Anyway, I want to talk to you about never forget. This is what communion is about. This is what Easter is about. <clears throat> How many of you know God is always talking? Come on, talk to town. Come on up here. Let's ask her to help me with a sermon illustration. Well, not a sermon, an illustration. I'm going to ask her some questions, and she's going to answer me. Like, uh, how long have you been married? Uh, and what's your husband's name? Oh, let's see, let me think of something. Wrong. How old are you? No, 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 I'm not asking that. Um, <laughs> um, but anyway, okay, that's good. You can go sit down. I, it didn't go like I thought it was going to go. I, I was going to ask her. She answered me. If you notice, she didn't answer me in English. She answered me out of English. A lot of us think God is not talking because we don't comprehend what he's saying. But just because I don't comprehend doesn't mean I'm not getting answers. It means I've got to do what I've got to do to understand what he's saying. And a lot of times we want to require God to speak to us on our terms when we have to meet God on his terms. And so I just want to, I just want to, encourage you tonight. God is speaking. He's, he is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. He's always speaking. Do what you need to do to get in the place to hear His voice and hear what He's saying. I'm sorry, I just don't buy into those people who teach and believe that He quit talking a long time ago or He quit talking at the conclusion of the Word because he's, He talked to me last night and this morning. Anyway, let's go ahead and get into this word, 1 Corinthians 11 and 23. 1 Corinthians 11 and 23. He said, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he passed, he was betrayed, on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup and after supper said, the cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim, that's a powerful word when you get into the Greek, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Again, I want to talk about never forget. I saw a bumper sticker and I've seen t-shirts and different things and had pictures of the Twin Towers and it said, we will never forget. I've seen t-shirts and signs and things depicting soldiers and military and say, we will never forget. And that's a great sentiment and, and, and hopefully it's of the heart of whoever came up with it. But the truth is, as human beings, we often forget. As a lot of people have forgotten about 9-11. It's, been, it's hard to believe it's been as long ago as it's been. A lot, a lot of people have forgotten about World War II and World War I. And I, I love the World War II era and the things from that and stories and movies and things about that. But a lot of people have forgotten that as that generation has passed away. I'll never forget a couple of years ago, I had a meeting with another pastor friend of mine. We went to a, a restaurant and that was on Veterans Day. And that Veterans Day, they were having uh, free, giving free lunches to all veterans. And so we went in and said, of course, the place was crowded. Uh, you know, like how church feels up when you have dinner, but um, free dinner. But anyway, the place was crowded. And so the, the that pastor and I finally got a table. We went in and sat down and we're sitting there talking a little bit. About this time, this old guy walks up and just lays his walking stick on the table. He said, I'm sitting with you guys. And I had a walking stick. I said, have, have a seat. Yes, sir. We got to talking. And he was a World War II veteran. And so for about a, the next hour, we sat there in total silence and just listened to him tell stories about fighting in, in the World War II and different things. And it was just, I wish I'd had the sense to turn my phone on or whatever. It was just an amazing time. But I love that era. But... Uh, as that generation dies out, unfortunately, a lot of people forget. A lot of people, my dad was a, a Korean War veteran, and as that generation dies out, people tend to forget. And then you have Vietnam, and a lot of those veterans are now getting up in age and af afraid that when that generation dies out, there's a, there's a danger of forgetting. And then of course, the recent wars, the Gulf War, Afghanistan, and all the Kuwait, all the different wars, different things going on. So though we had good intentions, we don't want to forget. The Bible gives us kind of an explanation of it in, second, in Judges 2 and 10. It said that whole generation was also gathered to their ancestors. That generation died. And after them, another generation rose up who did not know the Lord or the works he had done for Israel. So what we see that as generations pass, they take with them the memories and the, the things of, that impacted that generation. And so what Jesus told his disciples, and then Paul is again to the, telling the Corinthian church, the church at Corinth, when you do this, remember the sacrifice that was made for you. Anytime you break the bread and you drink the cup, Remember the sacrifice that was given for you. Anytime you drink the, fruit, eat, drink the fruit of the vine or you eat the bread, and I don't think he's necessarily just talking about, Pastor Mel, communion. I think he's talking about where we get the, 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 the tradition of saying the blessing over our meal. I think every time you sit down to eat or every time you take a drink, you should do it in remembrance I don't think it should just be communion. It is communion, but I think really what we need to do is every time we eat, because he goes on in this chapter and tells them, he said, some of you don't come to take the Lord's Supper. You come to get a free meal. Remember he told them when they were following him around in, in, in the wilderness. And if they, he said, you don't follow me because you want to hear what I've got to say. You follow me because I fill your bellies. I give you the fishes and the loaves. That's why you're following me. So, so Paul told him, the, the church at Corinth, he said, you've got houses. Stay home and eat. If you come to do the Lord's Supper, you come to remember the sacrifice that was made for you. And so 
we, we see this, and I think that has a little bit to do when he goes on to say, those that eat and drink unworthily. And I don't know about you, but I remember when I was a kid, that scripture really bothered me. He goes on, and I'll read it maybe in a little bit. He says, those who eat and drink of the cup unworthily eat and drink judgment to themselves. And for this cause, many of you are sick and weak and many dead, or he said sleep, but many are dead because you eat and drink. And so I can remember, you know, taking communion. Oh, Jesus, whatever I got to do, you know, just, just, to, just, just thanking God after I gulped the juice down that I was still alive. But I don't think that's what God meant. I think he was saying it doesn't become common practice. But we remember when we're doing that, I'm saved through the blood of Jesus. I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. So he was talking about this, remember it as often as you do this, remember me in it. There's a, oh, I don't want to get, I don't, don't want to, can, can I be daddy a minute? There's a, there's a trend today to erase history. Our cancel culture. And to try to erase history. What did, the, what did someone say? Those who don't learn from history are bound to repeat it. You can't erase history. What happened, happened. And whether you like it or not, it has something to do with where we are today. And so, uh, and that's what somebody said. They're going to keep on till, they, till they, they make this illegal because it's offensive. And it's violent. And it has, and so they're just, they're just working. So you can't erase history. You have to remember the great things that brought us to the place we are. But the, the devil wants to erase the, the fact of Calvary. And I'm not just talking about in this, you know, them taking the manger scenes off Main Street and out of the city hall and making it illegal to have anything religious now on, on uh, community property or government property. I'm not just talking about that. I'm talking about in the churches. They're taking power in the blood out of their songbooks. I'm going to preach if y'all keep on now. Don't, won't you? you holler and sick them to the bulldog. They're taking power in the blood out of the hymn books and they're taking the blood out of the gospel and they're, they're taking the cross away and they're taking the thing. It's too violent and too bloody and it's, it's too politically incorrect. God has never been politically correct. And so they're trying to rewrite the history of the gospel. But I'm here to tell you there's power in the blood. You know what we might, Kayla, we might need to break that out every once in a while. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power, would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. Amen? So we can't allow them to rewrite the history. Jesus said as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me in our verse that we brought out, he said, this is my body, which is for you, broken, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember the sacrifice I made for you and for the body of Christ. So we want to talk about this a little bit. Number one, I want to talk about, number one, the broken body. Let's see if we can dive into this a little bit. First Corinthians 11 and 23. For I have received from the Lord what I also passed to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord took, Bread, he gave thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do in remembrance of me. On the night he was betrayed, here Jesus knows within a few hours they're going to come and take him away. He's going to be chained, he's going to be beaten till his face is beyond recognition. The Bible talks about his vesture, his face, his appearance wasn't even that of a human when they got through beating him. So they blindfolded him and the soldiers would walk up and hit him in the face and say, all right, prophet, tell us who did it. They placed the crown of thorns, not like we see, not briar bushes, but six inch and five, four to six inch thorns shoved down on his head. And then they took a, a, a rod and beat it over the top of his head to drive the thorns into his, into his brow. And this was just the beginning. Then they whipped him till you could see the bones and the inner parts of his body and and eventually, then, and then the, the thing that, that a lot of us, we think is persecution, they lied about him and spit on him and mocked him and then hung him on the cross and still mocked him and said, if you're really who you are, come down. He knew he was facing all of this. And the Bible said he took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks. 
You know, sometimes I have a hard time thanking God when I've got a headache. I know you don't know what I'm talking about. Sometimes people will give me problems or grief in my life and I have a hard time being thankful or being grateful because something somebody said, much less seemed like the whole world nailing me to a cross, but he broke it and he gave thanks. He's the one that said to Paul, tell him I said rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. He didn't tell us to do anything he couldn't do or didn't do. He gave thanks. And Paul said, he makes, or, or Paul here makes a powerful statement, number B, Philippians 3 and 7. But everything that was gained to me, I have considered to be lost because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them filth so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. Paul saying, you know what? Before I found Christ, I was on my way up, and he was. He was working his way up in the political scene he was, he was getting to be somebody. He was known. He was becoming a ruler. He said, I was, I was very, very vigilant in the law and in legal matters. But then he met Christ. He found Christ. And here's the important thing. He said, when I saw, when I came to know Christ, my priorities changed. My priorities changed. What I thought was important before Jesus became nothing after I met Jesus. What I thought was my life's goal before I met Jesus became no longer was a goal to me in my life that I may know him. Not about him, know him. I, you know, there's, there's, there's people in the world I'd like to know, I'd like to meet. There's people that impress me and I'd like to meet. Some have already gone, some are still around. But Paul said the main goal in my life is that I may know Jesus not just know about Jesus. We've got to get the church beyond memorizing a few verses and getting a gold star for attendance and thinking we've got somewhere. I want to know Jesus. I want to know him. I know a lot about a lot of people, but I want to know him. I want to know him. I mean, I want to know the sound of his voice. I want to know the sound of his breathing. I was praying the other day. I said, God, I want to be so close. I can hear your breath. I want to be so close. I can hear your whisper. And God said, really? And when he said, really, I stopped. Because he said, really, in one of them ways where you're like, this ain't, this is serious. Do you really want to hear my thoughts? Do you really want to? And then I got thinking, I don't know. I, <laughs> I remember one time I prayed that and, and I, I remember I was talking, I couldn't even go to the gas station. I would see people that I knew with, that just were just so miserable and I said, I'm just crying all the time. And I told Pastor Mel, well, we were talking, I said, man, I, I, if I go to the gas station, I'll just break out in tears. He said, yeah, man, gas is going up. <laughs> Missed the whole point. He's gotten saved since then. But, it was, but, but that's what God said when I said, God, I want to know your heart. I want to know you. I want to know you. He said, really? You can. But it takes staying in my presence and not being distracted. I get, I get alarmed sometimes. My wife and I will go out to eat. And I tell you, I, unless it's one of my kids, I don't usually answer my phone when we're eating. When, I'm, when it's her, it's her. I don't put it on the table face up or face down. And, and so the only time I'll get on my phone is if she's on hers first. <laughs> but I want, I, want to give, yeah, I want to give God that attention. God, before I check my phone, I want to check you. Before I check my emails, I want to check you. Before I check my computer, I want to check you. Before I do it, before I turn the news on and get the coffee, Lord, I just want to take first thing on my mind, Lord, is you that I may know him. Then he said, no, not just know him. He said, I want to know him in the fellowship, number C. My goal, he said in verse 10, is to know him, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Sufferings. I want to know Jesus not just in the good times. I want to know him in the bad times. 
I want to know about how he made it through that he could give thanks facing the cross and the things before the cross. I want to know how he dealt with the, the devil face to face tempting him and he quoted the word and drove him away. Lord, I want to know you not just in the good times, but I want to know you in the bad times because life will bring suffering. You don't have to be a Christian to have a hard life. You don't have to be a Christian to have a bad day. Life will bring suffering. I want to know Jesus in the suffering. I want to know him more in the suffering than I guess I do in the good times. Because see, a lot of people, when they get into hard times, they think God's 100 miles away. Lord, I want to know you even in the fellowship of suffering. Remember the Hebrew children? Crank the, the fire up seven times hotter and throw them in. So hot it burnt the ropes off of them. And what did the king say? I see four men in the flame. And the fourth one is likened to the Son of God. That's knowing him in the fellowship of suffering. That's walking. Don't you want to be so close to God that when they turn the heat up seven times hotter, you and him are walking around, fellowshipping, talking, communion, in the fellowship of his suffering. I want to know you in the fellowship of your resurrection. I told the devil that today. I said, oh, guess what, devil? I just found a golden gem. Now, anytime you try to put me down, I'm going to say, Jesus got up and walked out of the tomb. I'm going to get up and walk out of this. I'm going to know him in the resurrection. I'm going to know him. He's talking about a resurrection of eternal life, but I'm going to know him. I'm getting up again from where I'm at today. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection because that same, that same spirit that raised Jesus up is alive in you and me, the word of God says. It's in alive in us. So why was his body broken? Isaiah 53 and four. Yet he himself bore our sickness. He carried our pains. But we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our transgressions, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him. We are healed by his wounds. Why was his body broken? So my body can be healed. Somebody needs to say, healing's coming tonight. Go ahead, say it. Healing's coming tonight, yeah. Yeah, you, you at home, healing's coming tonight. When we take of this communion, we're gonna remember that by his stripes, we are healed. He was wounded. He carried our sickness. He bore our sickness, and by his stripes, we are healed. I believe healing's coming tonight. It's coming tonight. That's why his body was broken that's why he received 39 stripes because there's 39 major diseases known to man. And he covered them all by his blood. So that's the broken body. Number two is the power of the blood. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-five. 25. In the same way after supper, he also took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant established by my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Before I get into that, let's, let's talk, well, we'll get into it in number B. Number one, they say that we get our blood from our father. As a matter of fact, the mother's blood and the child's blood are never supposed to mix. I think Lillian had problems with that one, you know, when the mother's blood and the child's blood mix because your blood generally comes, your blood and blood type, whatever generally comes from your father. And so that means Jesus had Holy Spirit running through his veins. Man, it started me on something when I got to, I got to looking where he talked about his, he was poured out. He said, I was a drink offering. I was poured out. And then he talked about the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Could it be that when his veins were opened on that cross, that was the release of the Holy Spirit on the earth? That on the day of Pentecost, he was able to come like a mighty rushing wind because he had he didn't have the blood of, of Joseph flowing through his veins. He didn't have the blood. See, you and I, we, we, the Bible tells, talks about the sins of the father are visited on the son, the grandson, and on generation to generation. So we have, there are issues that we don't understand because it was a great grandpa. There's issues in us we don't understand because it happened centuries ago and generations ago. Jesus didn't have that history. His father, well, let, 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 let me read because I get excited. Let me read Luke 1 34. 
Mary asked the angel, how can this be since I've not been intimate with a man? The angel replied to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. He was a child of the Holy Ghost, a child of the Spirit of God. So the blood that is is tainted with sin that flows through our veins didn't flow through his veins. There's power in the blood of Jesus. There's power in the blood of Jesus. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned, the blood of man has been tainted with sin. But when Jesus came, he was the new Adam and he started a new bloodline. And that bloodline is the blood that can fight off sin. We have white blood cells in our blood that fight off sickness and fight off infection. But we have something more powerful. We got the Holy Spirit of God coursing through our veins now that fight off sin and addiction and all the things of hell. That's the blood coursing through his veins. Hallelujah. Those generations of sin added on sin, added on sin. We're not up there. And said, so they said, my blood is the blood of the new covenant. Now you have to know a little bit about the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, when they would make a covenant, a lot of times a, a more serious covenant, like for instance, a, a, a man and woman betrothed to be married, the fathers would take an animal and they would cut that animal into two pieces and lay it on the floor and let it bleed and then both fathers would walk through the blood and then they would walk around the carcass of that animal and come back together as a signet that said and then, and then basically would say now let this be done to us if we break the covenant and so they would walk through the blood and make a trail around that animal saying that even when we're apart we're still in covenant even when we go our separate ways we're, we're still in covenant and so when Jesus died on the cross the Holy Spirit walked through the blood and said now you and I we're in covenant even though we're apart we're in covenant even though you may stray we're in covenant Woo, hallelujah we're in covenant he's married to the backslider we're still in covenant that one that you're worried about that lost loved one God said I'm married to the backslider we're in covenant I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do everything in my power to bring them back to the place of sacrifice understand now the power of the blood Matthew 9 and 12 but when he heard this he said Those who are well don't need the doctor, but the sick do. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I didn't come to call the righteous, but the sinners. See, a lot of people think that covenant is for those that do good and do everything just right. You don't need the blood. If you're perfect, Pastor Mel was talking about perfect. You don't need the blood if you're perfect. The blood sacrifice was not for the perfect, it was for the unperfect. It was not for those that kept the letter of the law and walked perfect in the law. It was for those that that, that needed the mercy and the grace of God. That's what the blood covered about and that's what Jesus did. That's what this whole thing about communion is. I was not perfect. I have not been perfect, but I'm covered by the blood. When God looks at me, he doesn't see my past. He sees the blood. For by grace you are saved through faith, not of works lest anyone should boast. So that's the, the body and the blood that he talked about. And then he said in verse 26, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Proclaim, it means to shout or announce the the death of Jesus. Not just the death, the purpose of his death. Do you know God loved you so much he died for you? Do you know God loved you so much he died for you? That'll strike down about any argument that somebody wants to come up with. Because I'll tell you right now, Allah didn't die for you. Muhammad didn't die for anybody. Buddha didn't die for anybody. Jesus gave his life for us. See, these other religions require you to give your life for them. But Jesus gave his life for us. So tonight we're going to participate in the communion. And we're going to do this in remembrance of the sacrifice. Of the, to me, I have a little statue of in, in, of the Garden of Gethsemane. And Pastor Mel, I think when I read about where Jesus was in such agony, the Bible said he was in agony and distress, and he told his disciples, "Can't you see? I am sorrowing to. I'm about to die under the load of facing the cross in the Garden of Gethsemane, till his sweat became like great drops of blood." 
And, and, and to me, I don't know, that touches me about as much as the cross does. To know that he was in such a place of wrestling his flesh and his spirit. Because even though he was 100% God, he was still 100% man. Wrestling the flesh with the will of God and the spirit. The spirit with the will of God and the flesh with the will of man. And I said, you know, so many of us find ourselves in Gethsemane so many times. Wrestling between the will of God and the desire of the flesh. I don't think there's any greater desire that this body, I think that's why someone who commit suicide they, they just really have to be out of their mind because this body fights I've been there so many times was a few a few weeks ago with my mom they called us in and you know she'd been you know she'd been sick for a long time and was had lost all this weight and they call us in on Friday and, and and we just don't we just don't think she's gonna make it you might want to come and, and and made provision for us to come in and spend the night she was alive the next Tuesday because the body struggles so hard to live body struggles so hard and so Jesus the flesh was struggling with the, the pain that he was facing and the spirit was struggling to do the will of God so can I tell you he knows where we are he knows where we get and we go through Gethsemane on a regular basis God this is what I this is your will for me but this is my desire help me to overcome help me to get to the place to say even so, your will be done. When I'm facing the struggle with my flesh and my spirit, help me to get to the place to say, even so, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus, because you were wounded for my transgressions, you were bruised for my iniquities. And Lord, like Pastor Mel was saying, we've got to humble ourselves to say, I've had a few transgressions and I've had some iniquities and I've had some sin, but tonight I just ask you right now, later on in that chapter, he said, if a man will examine himself, if a person will examine himself honestly, they won't need to be judged. Examine yourself honestly. If you need, if you need before we take this communion, Lord, if there's anything in my life, I just, I just confess and repent it and I ask you to just cleanse me tonight. If you're watching this, Lord, examine yourself honestly and, and make it right with the Lord so when we take this communion, you can drink the life of Jesus into your body, into your spirit. Go ahead and stand up on your feet and get your communion cups ready. Father, I thank you for the sacrifice. I thank you for the sacrifice. I thank you that healing is coming. Lord, there's some folks tonight participating in the healing is coming through the body and the blood. Deliverance, I thank you for deliverance. I thank you for setting us free. I thank you, Father, for removing, removing the hold and breaking the chains of the enemy tonight. We'll peel this top layer off to take the wafer out. Jesus said, take and eat, for this is my body which is broken for you. And when we do this, can I tell you something? Healing is just as much part of the gospel as salvation. By his stripes we were healed. A lot of people will proclaim salvation, but they'll back up on healing. But healing is just as much a part of the gospel as salvation. You need a healing tonight. When we take this wafer, I want you to start claiming the healing power. Lord, let that same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus up flow through my body tonight. Go ahead and take and eat. Then he said that this is the cup of my, the blood of my new te of the New Testament, the new covenant poured out. Lord, I just thank you. I thank you, Lord, for your spirit that sets us free. I thank you that I am free. The enemy has no hold. Come on, you need to tell. I, the enemy has no hold over me. He has no hold on whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And I'm just proclaiming my drinking the vine of the vine, the fruit of the vine tonight. I proclaim freedom and liberty. I claim it not only on me, but on those I'm praying for, on those in my household. I'm claiming victory over for those that I love, those of my family. God, I just proclaim victory in Jesus' name. Go ahead, take and drink. Come on, somebody give him some praise in the house now. Come on, hallelujah.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Well, it will wash it. Sing it again. And oh, the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. family member, friend. God, I pray that your spirit would just shine off of us. God, that when we speak life to people, God, that it would just make an eternal difference in them. I thank you, Father, for the sacrifice. Come on, somebody give him a praise in the house. Amen. God bless you.